Well, everybody, welcome to tonight's webinar with Liz Fusco. Um, I'm super excited for tonight because um, knowing everyone's headed into the race season, the topic of hydration is a very important one. Um, I know many of you uh, have uh, have uh, got races coming up, if not this weekend, championship races coming up in the next couple of weeks. So hydration is a key topic. And um, Liz has worked with, with many of you I know who are on the line. Um, a lot of great questions that we've already received from you. And I know uh, Liz is going to cover a lot of content in the next half an hour or so. We've, we're, we've got a hard stop at 45 minutes. Um, past the hour or quarter to, to, to nine East Coast time. So I'm going to hand it over to Liz um, to talk to um, this great topic of hydration, um, how to do it, when to do it, how long to do it, um, and, and so we can all have some great racing coming up. So Liz, welcome and over to you. All right, great. So let's pull up these slides here. I think it's really important to understand some of the really basic things about hydration. Um, it, it really can be quite simple. Um, it doesn't have to be an over, overly complicated process. Um, we're having a little bit of Just give me, yeah, one technical second. difficulties here. Um, but I think, you know, when you're going into your racing season, uh, a lot of things are changing outside too. And I think it can be hard for athletes to kind of grasp how their hydration status might change um, when there's differences in uh, temperature outside, um, how to hydrate effectively, um, depending on what the conditions are. And that is all for my banter. I think we're ready to kind of get into it now. Liz, so. just one thing before we get started. For those of you that haven't used uh, the, the Zoom a platform before at the bottom of your uh, screen there should be a q and a section so at any point if you just want to test that now um i'm reviewing those questions as they come in and and, and through liz's presentation we will um try and answer as many of your questions as we possibly can so if you want to just test it out now um, and then we can we can get rolling liz great so why don't we start off with a quick little overview of what we'll be talking about um, pretty simple. We'll start with what the functions of water are in the body. Uh, I think, you know, I asked this question to a lot of groups and uh, the easy question is it hydrates you. You know, what does water do? It hydrates you, but it does a lot more than that. Um, we'll talk about the different factors that impact hydration. Um, some of the different things to look for to know if you're drinking a little too much water or maybe not quite enough. And then how to kind of find your groove, find your swing when it comes to staying hydrated uh, from day to day. Uh, of course, we'll end with 10 simple steps to stay hydrated. Um, and on to the first one. What does water do? Um, it does a lot of things. Uh, it's not only helping to hydrate your cells. Uh, Kim, you can go ahead and click through. There should be more. Oh, it's going to do that the whole time. Great. Okay, so um, plays roles in nutrient absorption. So it helps you to absorb different water soluble vitamins, for example, like the B vitamins and vitamin C. Um, it helps you to digest your food and transport those things. Um, it provides a cushion for bones and organs, all of your connective tissues. So it kind of helps, can help prevent injuries from that sense. Um, this might be a familiar slide to some of you. Um, but it also can help control body temperature. So it help, can help you thermoregulate when it's hot and humid out or even when it's cold. Um, and it has a really important uh, role in immune function by helping to moisten the airways in your navel cavity, those in your mouth, um, eyes and nose. That's usually kind of your first line of defense uh, against invading microorganisms. And then once, if the microorganisms actually get into the system, water is part of the white blood cells that fight infections uh, and improve your overall immunity. They are your immunity. Um, so you can see a couple of other things here, helping to prevent constipation, um, helping to dissolve minerals. There's, there's thousands of biochemical reactions that water's involved within the human body too. So really any type of performance uh, roles, what we will talk about next, um, are also really important to think about. Um, here's some of the things that are really important to think about when you're trying to see how much you're sweating. 
um, obviously how intensely you're working is going to play a factor in, um, you know, how much speed and power you're emitting is going to play a factor in how much you sweat. The temperature outside, um, how humid it is outside, how windy it is outside. And, and that can also be in a uh, sweaty erg room. Uh, let's say there's not enough fans um, or the room just doesn't have good ventilation. I know that there's a couple of um, areas in the country where it can be pretty, pretty boggy inside an erg room. Um, that can really affect your sweat rate a lot. And, and what I find actually is that um, some rowers will have higher sweat rates when they're inside on the ergs without a lot of, um, without a lot of air ventilation versus being out on the water. And I'm sure some of you have, have felt that as well, um, having some puddles under the erg and things like that. Obviously the clothing that you choose is gonna impact your hydration status. Um, if it's too tight to your skin, if you're wearing too many layers, uh, maybe you're not wearing enough layers and you start shaking, um, you know, all of those things play, play a role. Um, so choosing the right clothing is really important. Um, and then, of course, how well trained you are, what your training status is. Um, sweat, sweating and sweat rate, it, it's actually an adaptation uh, it can be a, a training and an exercise adaptation or an environmental adaptation. And it's your body's way of uh, improving your ability to tolerate stress um, in the form of heat and humidity. Um, so as athletes become more fit, as they train uh, at higher intensities for longer durations in more heat and humidity, they actually start to sweat a little bit sooner and they start to sweat a little bit more profusely. Um, so if you are kind of a highly trained athlete and you're also training in heat and humidity, your sweat rate can be very, very high and it can be pretty hard to keep up with. Um, and genetics, uh, being the, the last on this list of the, the really important factors to determine sweat rate. Some people just don't have as many like physical sweat glands in number as others. Um, and part of that's related to genetics and part of that's actually related to your environment um, in the first couple of years of your life, which is, we don't have enough time to get into those details on the genetic side of things, but there is a genetic component as well. And I'm sure that, again, I, I think that rowers have a tendency to kind of compare themselves to each other, maybe because they're in the boat together. You might notice that you're sweating more than your teammate or you're sweating less than your teammates. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's completely normal. Um, and it can be any of these things. Does anybody have any questions about what, um, what factors can influence hydration uh, or any questions about anything I've said so far? Um, there's a question, Liz, about distilled water. Um, can you talk a little bit about distilled water and, and the use of, and how that relates to performance? Yeah, so we'll get into, we'll get a little bit more into the different types of beverages uh, later on. But distilled water is essentially a type of purification to re remove any added solutes or any dissolved solids in the water. So a distilled water will have, a, it's called total dissolved solid of somewhere around, it should be about zero. Uh, and that's what you use in kind of like in scientific studies and people will use distilled waters for babies and things like that as well. Spring water has uh, dissolved solids around 100, 125. Um, if you have kind of, if you have quote unquote hard water um, in bigger cities and things like that, it can be up in the 300s, 400s. Um, so I don't think that there's necessarily a benefit to choosing distilled water over another water, um, but definitely including water, including um, especially um, you know, clean sources of water, depending on where you're living, um, is an important part of hydration. It doesn't have to be distilled, though. Okay, cool. Sweet. Yeah, let's keep, keep rolling and, um, and, and we can come to some more questions a little bit later. Okay, so the next part, okay, we know what water's doing. So let's talk a little bit about what you might be feeling if your hydration practices are a little bit off. Um, Overhydration is something that is actually fairly common. Um, it's, it occurs when an athlete is consuming more fluid than they're losing. Um, sometimes it's significantly more, 
Uh, again, that's going to depend on the athlete, uh, but it can lead to gastric discomfort. So uh, bowel urgency, um, obviously it's going to, you know, result in many trips to the bathroom, which as a rower, if you're getting all suited up and getting ready to go out and launch, especially, you know, earlier in the year, this time of year, you have to go in, take everything off to go to the bathroom. I think sometimes people maybe avoid drinking a ton of water um, at certain times of day because they don't want to take all their stuff off or they drink a bunch of water before they go out, be, go out because they want to try to hydrate enough to go out on the water. But if you're going to the bathroom, you know, multiple times in an hour, which we'll talk about a little bit, then you're probably over hydrating. Uh, the issue with that is that it, it doesn't actually get funneled and filtered into the cells. Um, any of my people out there who have taken, you know, basic physiology or science classes, you know that electrolytes like sodium help channel water in and out. It's called diffusion. And when there's a lot of water coming in, it can actually kind of throw off the balance of electrolytes. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it can um, increase the risk for low levels of sodium, which can um, manifest as maybe heart palpitations or something like that. Um, and it can also increase the risk for muscle cramps because it kind of waters down the electrolytes. Um, so we definitely want to be careful to avoid overhydrating, first of all, because it's annoying. And second of all, because it's definitely not going to improve performance. Third of all, it might be a little bit risky health-wise. And I'm, I'm kind of, uh, you know, people have actually died from overhydration. It's called hyponatremia. So it is something to be careful of. Don't want anybody to, you know, go avoiding water because of it. But um, just keep it in mind that you can't have too much of a good thing. And then some of these signs and symptoms, I'm sure you've felt. Uh, I think we all have um, potential for having muscle cramps. Um, early fatigue in training, uh, especially when you're training in the heat and humidity or you're in a climate where um, you're not comfortable uh, or you're wearing too much clothing, you might feel that early fatigue. Um, increased perceived exertion, meaning it feels like you're working a lot harder than you actually are. Um, now, I don't have a citation for this, but there was just a really interesting study where they actually put a heating pad on a cyclist's backs to simulate heat and humidity, um, but they tracked their body temperature to make sure that it didn't change their body temperature. And just their perceived exertion from feeling hot from the heating pad alone, that decreased their performance. So really being coming accustomed to being in that uncomfortable environment is important too. And other signs of delayed uh, are delayed recovery. So it take, takes longer to recover from hard training sessions or long days of training. Uh, maybe you have an extension of muscle soreness. Um, and then during sessions or even over the course of the day, um, I know that there's a lot of people um, on the line that are in school or maybe they have a full-time job. If you find that it's hard for you to concentrate over the course of your day, maybe you've trained in the morning or something, um, or you're having headaches that are kind of frequent, those are also potential signs of dehydration. So, does anybody have any questions about signs and symptoms of overhydration or dehydration? Um, things to look out for, things that you've maybe observed, um, anything out there? Yeah, Liz, there was a question just leading into um, racing with, with, with it getting warmer obviously the air temperature, how, how, how would you advise people just with the changing um, climate, how, um, how, to, how to make adjustments re regarding the, the balance between being hydrated um, opt optimally? Yeah, yeah, that's really important. And actually that question is a perfect segue into our next section. Okay. So maybe we just keep on rolling. Um, so the really important thing um, with the changing climate and that's kind of why we're having this conversation right now is to, to figure out how to find your specific, go back one slide for me, how to find your specific hydration kind of swing. So we've already talked about all the things that it does, but here's a little bit of a recap. So temperature regulation, recovery at the cellular level because of all those functions, um, accelerating recovery from sessions, reducing risk of injuries and cramps, all these things. So we're gonna go through a ten, basically a 10 step process now for making sure that you're staying hydrated. So on to the next one. 
step one. Um, now, I would say that these general guidelines would apply to anyone who's casually, recreationally rowing, or anyone who is uh, under the age of 18, um, would basically be just to take your weight, divided by two, and roughly that many ounces per day. That's your base amount of, of water recommendations. So if you weigh, I'm gonna make the math easy, easy on myself, if you weigh 100 pounds, you should be consuming 50 ounces of water a day, plus whatever you're losing in your training sessions. Now this is where it can be complicated. It can be, does not have to be. Um, it can be as simple as just hopping on the scale uh, right before you hit the water and then right after you get off the water. Um, your goal when you're kind of checking your pre and post training weight is to be about the same um, as when you checked before practice. So you wanna drink enough fluid to pretty much replace what you lost. Um, let's say you, uh, you weigh 100 pounds and you lose two pounds. That's about 2% of your body weight. 2% of your body weight is kind of about the max. So for most people that are listening in, that's anywhere from two to four pounds, absolute maximum should be lost over the course of a training session. Obviously the four pound loss being the larger people on the line. Um, but really, if you lose a pound um, in an hour, that's 16 ounces. So 16 ounces of fluid is what would be necessary to replace that. Um, so, sorry everybody, my dog just uh, busted in. Um, so basically you're just gonna be checking your pre-post weight, replacing the fluid that you lose. It can get a lot more complicated and, and that's why I kind of covered it up because it, it, this involves looking at urine losses, um, weighing your water bottles before and after training sessions, um, and then you have to kind of add up all these things at the bottom. Now, I, I do this work with, with some of the elite level athletes, especially when we're you know, preparing to be racing in a hot and humid climate. But you also have to remember that, that a sweat rate that you calculate, you spend all this work doing on any given day is gonna change based off of all those factors. Um, all those things can vary. So my, my basic rule of thumb is to just keep it simple. If you hop on the scale before and after practice and you lost four or five pounds, you probably didn't drink enough fluid. If you hop on the scale before and after practice and you gain two pounds, you might have drank a little bit too much fluid. Um, and so that's kind of where this step one goes. Let's keep it simple. Um, so rather than trying to do all that math, um, let's just choose fluids that are hydrating, which is, uh, according to this study, all of them. Um, in this research study, basically what they did was had subjects come in and drink about a liter of different fluids. Um, they drank them over a period of, I think, two hours, and then they measured, um, or they drank the fluid, and then over the course of two hours, they measured the subject's urine output to see if some beverages were, you know, less hydrating than others or more hydrating than others. One question that I get a lot is, um, is coffee dehydrating or is caffeine dehydrating? That's what they were trying to figure out. What they found was that none of these drinks were less hydrating than others. So bottom line, all fluids and foods that are high in fluid are going to contribute to your hydration. What they did find was that there were a couple of things that helped them retain water a little bit more. So Cam, getting back to the question um, that was asked and you know, an erasing scenario, like how do we make sure that we optimize our hydration? Um, there's a couple more steps that we'll get to to make sure that you're hydrated when you get there. Um, but let's say you have several heats over the course of the day or you are racing in a couple of different boats, um, you're warming up, maybe, maybe people are uh, manipulating their weight through sweating before weighing in, um, choosing uh, a high electrolyte drink like an oral rehydration solution. Um, I would presume that's something like a Pedialyte or something. Uh, choosing that or skim milk, whole milk, orange juice, these things may help you to retain the fluid a little bit more. And the reason why is because those were the beverages that were highest in, in electrolytes. So um, incorporating electrolytes, mainly salt, 
um, helps you to hold on to fluid. Um, and that's what we saw in this study. So drinking fluids through the day, drinking fluid with meals um, is also really important to increase absorption and help with digestion. So here's some more simple tips. And this is a really easy, you know, some of these things are really simple for racing. Um, snacking on fruit. Uh, fruits are 90 plus percent water. Um, you know, having smoothies, uh, making a smoothie for breakfast. One of the things I recommend a lot is to, you know, make a smoothie and have it in one of those um, uh, like hot cold containers that can keep things cold for a day or two. Um, bring a smoothie to, to the competition with you to the course. Um, having, you know, cut up veggies, uh, having cartons of milk, glasses of milk as part of recovery. Um, just different ways to incorporate high water things into your day to day. And this is kind of the big one here. So step one, we said, you know, there's a little bit of math you can do. You can check your weight before and after practice and see where you're at. But these three things really can help you identify how you know where you're at. If you are uh, waking up in the morning and your urine color is golden, um, or bronze, I should say, um, maybe it's a little bit too dark. Um, if you wake up like that, or if you're waking up feeling thirsty, maybe you check your morning weight and you're noticing that you're a little bit light and all those other things, you know that you probably didn't do a great job of hydrating over the past 24 hours. So that first morning urine color can really help you figure out how you did the day before. Over the course of the day, if it's been more than three hours since you went to the bathroom, especially if you're also not peeing that much when you do go, uh, you're dehydrated. Um, so four or five, six hours going without going to the bathroom, you're definitely dehydrated. And it can take about a day to recover from that, about 24 hours to fully rehydrate. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum here, we have uh, using the restroom more than once an hour, really high volumes, and urine color is clear. Um, that's a sign of overhydration. Now, sometimes people toggle between these two things. They'll either be dark or they'll be clear. Um, that's kind of a sign that maybe you're drinking water too aggressively. I think some people chug fluid um, and taking it all in one hit doesn't really give it a lot of time to absorb. And then I also think people selectively drink fluid. So maybe they're drinking a lot of water at a certain time of day, and then they're kind of forgetting about it when they go to work or when they go to class. Um, so being consistent with your fluid intake and incorporating fluid rich foods like fruits and vegetables, not only going to help you with some of those other R's that we'll get to in a couple weeks, but are also going to help you find that sweet spot where you have a moderate urine volume, uh, meaning you could go, you could wait a little bit, like 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's pale yellow and you're using the restroom about every two hours. Um, this is the easiest way to do it and it's, it's pretty darn effective too. And then we've got some other ones. So now that we know you wanna aim for, you know, that pale yellow color, uh, moderate volume, going to the bathroom every two hours or so, your goal is to, is to show up at your training sessions or show up at your, you know, uh, in the boat, you know, not, not when you launch the boat, sometimes people will launch and then they do their warm up on the water and then they get into the start blocks and all of a sudden they've already been on the water for a half hour or 45 minutes, but you actually wanna be in the start blocks hydrated. So kind of having an understanding of how hot it is, how to dress, how much water to bring in the boat, before the race starts. You know, if, if you're launching and it's 95 degrees out and you're gonna warm up on the water before getting into the blocks, you're probably gonna sweat quite a bit before you shove off. Um, so really, you know, starting the effort in a hydrated state is really important. And that's where practicing becomes critical too, because it's not just the same amount of water every single day. It's a little bit more fluid, a little more electrolytes when it's hot and humid, and potentially being more selective about your fluid intake if it's cold out. Um, so that kind of leads into the next point, which is drink an appropriate amount of fluid during training um, and races based on all the factors that we talked about that influence sweat rate. 
Um, so you don't need to be chugging fluid aggressively if you don't sweat that much um, or if your sweat rate's low because it's windy and you're wearing a t-shirt. Um, kind of keep those things in mind and, and use that little bit of information about pre-practice weights potentially or you know urine color to see how you're doing in that sense. And then of course we want to replace the fluids that we lose in sessions or races. Um, this becomes really important for lightweights, especially if they're doing any type of weight manipulation with fluid. Like I said before, um, we really want to try to reduce body weight loss to no more than around 2% um, from training, from racing, from pre-weigh-in practices. Um, really that 2% mark is um, anything beyond that is when you're kind of getting into the territory of dehydration and it can negatively impact your performance for up to that long. Um, some of the signs too that you might need to add some more salt, electrolytes, are if you notice you've got some like salt brimming on your uni or maybe on your hat, uh, you can see salt crystals on your skin, on, on the side of your face. Those are signs that you might be losing quite a bit of electrolytes. Um, it's really easy to replace those just with foods um, like pretzels or crackers. Um, and those foods also could potentially be a pre-exercise fuel source uh, if they're nice and simple and easy to digest. Another R that we'll get to soon. So we're really just trying to do sort of damage control here. Show up hydrated, drink enough fluid to, you know, stay pretty even keel and then replace whatever you lose afterwards. So if there's not an availability for uh, foods, uh, maybe you're kind of racing out in the middle of nowhere or you ran out of snacks, um, or you are, you have really bad nerves, so you don't like to have solid food, maybe you're not feeling well around racing, um, choosing a sports food like an electrolyte drink, um, can be a good replacement when there's no food, um, but there's no specific reason why you definitely need to have a certain type of sports drink or anything like that. Um, they do, it's all salt. <laughs> the electrolytes are pretty similar among them all. Um, and then I think this tip is kind of simple, but, but people may forget it sometimes, you know, remembering to drink cold things when it's hot out, um, maybe even slushed things, or um, if you're getting in the boat and it's hot, freezing a water bottle, bringing the frozen bottle in there with you to kind of help you thermoregulate a little bit and rehydrate at the same time. Um, and then you know, if it's really cold, drinking some warming things uh, on your way to the boathouse on uh, mornings or, I don't know, it's not very practical when you're actually rowing, but uh, on the way there. Um, does anybody have any questions so far or before we get to the final 10th point? Yeah, there's a couple of questions that have, that have come in. Um, what's your opinion about salt tablets or supplements? Yeah, so I think... My opinion on salt tablets or supplements are kind of the same as my opinion on most other supplements. Um, if there's a food, if there's an option to do it with food, um, then that's going to be preferred. Um, you know, there's plenty of sodium in our foods and I personally love the way that salt tastes. So, you know, choosing salty foods are going to provide you with the same thing, essentially. Um, there are some specific ways to kind of measure the concentration of electrolytes in your sweat. Again, that's really high level stuff, but that's like the type of salty sweater that might qualify as needing something like a salt pill. Okay. So you're saying it, it really depends on the sweat, right? Depending on what, how they would, would adjust. Cause there's a bunch of other questions relating to, to weight making electrolytes. It really, you're saying a lot of it has to come down to, to, to practice. Yeah, and the best advice that I can give you if you're trying to, you know, implement some type of uh, water manipulation to make weight is you got to journal that stuff like you journal your, like your training journal, like just the way that you log your training sessions and how you feel in sessions and all those things, you should be logging, you know, your pre post training weights, and maybe doing many little calculations and seeing how much you're losing in those sessions. Um, 
and keeping track of that just so that you can kind of gauge where you typically are at. Remember, it's going to change based off of the season, based off the clothing that you're wearing and all these things. So um, collecting that information in a sort of, you know, unbiased self sort of way, recognizing like I'm looking at my fluid loss right now. Um, this is what I'm measuring in this weight change. Uh, that can be kind of helpful in identifying it. But yeah, people can vary so much. I, I measured, um, you know, a, on a, in one athletic group that I measured, their sweat rates varied from 35 ounces an hour to 98 ounces an hour. And it was the same workout. Yeah, so, there's, there's a lot of questions here just on, on, on timing. Um, you know, is it hours, minutes? How long does it take for the body to react? Um, right depending on the weather, depending on um, the type of racing. Can you, can you speak a little bit to the idea of how to practice? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the term kind of practicing when it comes to like sweating and understanding um, how your body's responding to different temperatures is called acclimatization. So through heat acclimatization, for example, you have those physiologic responses where by spending, you know, one to two weeks training in hot and humid climates, you start to sweat a little sooner and a little bit more profusely. Um, so there is this kind of physiologic adaptation that's happening that makes it really hard. And I know it's really annoying for people to not just get this solid number on like this many ounces per day of water is what you need to drink. But there's so many factors. Um, and it changes uh, from day to day, from season to season. So really like looking at the basics, like when you wake up in the morning and you pee in the toilet, is it dark orange or is it pale yellow? You know, do you wake up six times over the course of the night to go pee? If so, maybe you're drinking fluid a little bit too aggressively. Um, maybe you need to kind of taper your fluid and take towards the end of the day and drink that fluid earlier on in the day. Um, so taking the feedback that your body's giving you and, and using it, um, when it comes to, uh, like how to get better at it, it really is that it's being in tune with it, you know, knowing the difference between, um, having a high heart rate because you are tired and having high heart rate because you are super dehydrated. Um, it's, uh, you know, paying attention to that, the color and the amount that's coming out, all of those things. Um, and kind of keeping track. I know that's it's right, yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. There's there, there's a couple more questions just about the balance of sports drinks to electrolytes. How do you know when to drink more water than than an electrolyte? What's what, what's your simple formula to what's the best thing to to be to be using? Just yeah, that's a that's an easy one. So basically. It tends to be that the more you sweat, the more electrolytes you lose. Um, and so the greater your need is going to be to replenish those electrolytes. Um, so if you are doing an easy little steady state, half hour, 45 minutes, or maybe you're doing, um, you know, one heat that's six or seven minutes long, and you have a little bit of warm up, but it's cold outside, and you're not really sweating that much. Um, you don't feel like you're sweating, you know, your clothing's not wet. Uh, water is probably fine. If you feel comfortable in that, in that temperature, if you are going to the bathroom every two hours and it's pale yellow and moderate in volume, then you don't necessarily need an electrolyte drink. You don't need to aggressively drink water. Just paying attention to those easy things. Um, if you are sweating profusely, if you're losing, you know, more than two pounds, let's say, that's when you start to consider incorporating electrolyte drinks. When you add carbohydrate to those drinks is when the session's also an hour or longer. The carbohydrate is going to provide you with a little bit of energy. It's going to help to shuttle the fluid to your working tissues um, and deliver it because there's also electrolytes in there too to help to kind of get it absorbed. Um, so that's when I would incorporate a carbohydrate sports drink is during sessions that are kind of longer than an hour or so. Um, the other time to do that is uh, maybe in the hour or so before a race, if you had breakfast, you know, three or four hours beforehand and you've been warming up and walking around um, and you don't want to drink water, <laughs> that's a good time to do that. Um, but the more you're like, the higher the sweat rate is, 
um, you know, the more that you're losing, that's the, the, that's when you would incorporate more of a sports drink kind of approach or electrolyte drink approach. Do you have any recommendations for products? Lots of people have uh, questions about different types of products. How do you, how do you recommend people making decisions about what products to, to lean towards, whether they're commercial products, stuff that, 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 that you might not typically see on the, on the shop, so the shop shelves. How do you, how do you, how do you help people make decisions about what to use and what not to use? Yeah, it's really important. I would say, um, you know, the first thing is that it has to taste good. If you don't enjoy the way it tastes, you're probably not going to be that motivated to drink it. Um, so all in all, they're not, that different um, but I would be really careful to make sure that um, if you're choosing a sports drink that it is either a food um, so it's marketed as a food which means that it's inspected by the FDA or it is a third-party certified supplement um, so what I would recommend um, would be our, we have a sponsor, uh, their name is Thorn, and you may have seen them around, um, but they have an electrolyte sports mix that is um, NSF certified for sport, which means that it's tested for all banned substances and every batch is tested for that. It's the most stringent third party testing agency um, available. So there's actually a code if anyone wants to try their, um, their electrolyte replacement drink, the code is uh, USA row 10. And a portion of those proceeds will actually come back to us rowing and help with our fueling stations. Um, but again, NSF certified for sport, or the other third party organization you can check for is informed choice. I would always make sure that your any supplement that you have, but even an electrolyte supplement, even a salt pill, there was actually a wrestler who tested positive for a salt pill um, that he had taken uh, post weigh in. Any, anything that you put in should have that third party certification from NSF or informed choice. Okay, cool. What about um, low calorie uh, electrolytes? Any, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so um, again, it, it kind of gets back to if your session is short, um, but it's also hot out and humid, then that might be a time when you'd want to use a, a low calorie electrolyte replacement. Um, generally speaking, though, like sweat rate increases when the duration and the intensity of a session increases. And those are the types of sessions where you might actually benefit from having a little bit of carbohydrate. Uh, so as a rower, um, if, you know, if your sessions are more than 60 or 75 minutes, I'd recommend having the calories in the sports drink. So the low calorie ones could be for the opposite of such. Okay. Maybe and even for that situation of like between launching and coming off the start blocks. Yeah. What, what about um, the temperature of the drinks? I know that, that it's certainly a, a, during the summertime, um, we often yeah. see athletes running out of, of fluids while they're on the water. Do you have any recommendations for, for, for how to, A, a what temperature should, the, should the, the liquids be and then how to manage that over the course of a longer session? Yeah, this can be really challenging. I think that modern technology has made it a little bit easier. So in the training environment, um, using, using one of those kind of like thermal bottles that's going to keep things pretty cold. Um, cool fluids and cold fluids, um, they do help kind of mediate the increases in core temperature uh, that happen from exercise. So your body temperature, as you can feel uh, when you're training hard, um, increases over time. And that's one of the things that uh, we think kind of shuts off exercise, makes the body slow down and hit its, hit its wall. Um, so by controlling core temperature, even to the tiniest bit through um, taking, like I said, a frozen water bottle, one thing we were doing was freezing water bottles. And then by the time they got out on the water, the bottle was already slush. So just drinking slushy kind of, um, it could be like putting ice cubes in your uni, um, or using one of those kind of bigger thermal bottles. If you have a long session on the water, definitely cold, cold fluids can help when it's kind of unbearably hot, especially. Okay, cool. Um, and there's, there, there's a couple of questions here from, from some of our lightweight um, athletes. Um, in terms of 
in terms of clothing type, do you have any recommendations, um, you know, in terms of people that sweat a lot, what should they wear as opposed to people that don't sweat a lot? Do you have any, is that, is that within your uh, <laughs> range there of, of, of um, because I guess it does relate to, to hydration and, and, and dealing with temperature, but do you have any thoughts on, 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 on that one? It really does. I would, you know, maybe I need to study up on my fashion. Maybe I need to get a sponsor or something. Anybody know some new lemon people? Um, no, it's, it really is. It's going to come down to individual differences. You know, even, you know, every rower, every lightweight rower even is shaped a little bit differently. So the way that the clothing fits you, where it feels tight, if you feel comfortable in it, if it's too tight or too loose, um, those are the types of things that can actually impact your sweat, especially if something's too tight. Um, if it's too close to the skin and it doesn't really allow you to breathe very much. Um, if you are wearing too many layers, um, or if you're not wearing breathable fabrics, those are other things that can kind of increase your sweat rate. So it's just, it's kind of, again, kind of finding your own thing that works for you, finding the clothing that, that feels best on you, uh, when you're working hard. Um, and kind of going off of that okay. obviously the basics of like not wearing clothes that are too tight or too thick sure i, I mean you've covered lots of lots of really cool material we've got um probably four or five minutes left but there is another question here about um about just different ingredients for for food particularly during practice and and not just food but, but also drinks do you have any any suggestions on what could be helpful to to be consuming during practice yeah definitely and maybe we could do refuel as our next r ah the next that's one. a pretty good idea <laughs> yeah so um yeah tune in next time for the next r um but the general kind of rule of thumb for that is i know it's kind of annoying for me to say this again but you've got to find the things that work best for you um if you're working out for you know greater than 60 minutes so if you're somewhere in like the 60 to 90 minute range the recommendation is about 30 grams of carbohydrate which is one gel it's um two slices of you know two small slices of bread it's three dates um it's a palmful of dried cranberries it's uh you know, two or three scoops of uh, an electrolyte drink or even a homemade one made with like eight ounces of juice. We can get into that a little bit too. Um, but you want the foods that you take on the water to be lower in fat because fat kind of holds food in your stomach a little longer and you want that energy right away. Um, and you want to choose foods that are a little bit lower in fiber for the same reason. Fiber kind of slows down the digestive process and your purpose when you're on the water is to get the energy quickly and efficiently. Um, so choosing uh, easy to digest, kind of simpler carbohydrates, maybe a liquid form or a low fiber form, um, it, it's the easiest delivery system. Some athletes like to use like gummy worms or gummy bears. Uh, some people like to use um, fruit leathers. Uh, again, it kind of kind of depends on the person. People like fruit snacks a lot too. So I think you're onto something here. Maybe we should um, we should do another webinar looking at uh, at the R's. Maybe maybe we in a couple of weeks we can do another one and and talk a little bit more to this topic. What do you think? Yeah, I think especially with the with the racing coming along, talking about carbohydrates and the the, the impact that they can have kind of in the short term on on performance, in addition to long term, I think would be really cool. There's one, one last question and I think we can wrap things up here um, and it's a good one. How do you, how do you recommend for those that, that are consuming during practice, they get a sense of what water, what food to, to consume before and after practice? How do they, because there's only so many opportunities to race, how do you make decisions um, of how to adjust what you do during training with, with, with hydrating compared to on race day? Yeah, I would, um, do you have a, so I was a sailor in college and we used to have, we called them dress rehearsals. It's like practice practices, like race practices. Yep. Those would be a good opportunity to do it. Even if it's like 1500s, it's kind of close enough. Um, use those opportunities for sure. Use those training opportunities. But I would largely implore all of you to do your best to try not to overthink this process. At the end of the day, if you wake up in the morning and your pee's pale yellow, 
and throughout the day you're using the restroom every two or three hours you're checking your weight before and after sessions and you're putting back in what you're losing roughly you don't even have to do that as long as you're peeing every couple hours and it's and it's pale um then there doesn't have to be too much um measuring or fine tuning um, if you're struggling a little bit, like if you're finding that you, you know, maybe you have athletes or you are an athlete that's heart rate is spiking and you're, um, feeling dizzy and lightheaded and confused, passing out after practices or after races, um, you know, you'd look at a couple of different things that could be related to that, but one of them would be hydration. So it would be you know, how much water did you drink? How many times have you peed since you woke up this morning? Basic questions like that. And then the other, the opposite end of that is somebody who's drinking water so aggressively, like almost nervously that they're peeing all the time. They're peeing every half hour or so, um, or multiple times in an hour. So to that person, I'd say maybe drink a little bit less water. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but either drink a little less or sip it instead of gulp it or potentially incorporate some electrolytes, incorporate some, um, you know, saltier foods or some electrolytes in the actual liquid.